PG is on combat in almost literature to be handed in at the end of the month. Yes. <laughs> he's currently a creator at the German uh, Blade Museum, the Deutsche Spiegel Museum, and he organized uh, the exhibition The Sword, Form and Thought that was held uh, later this year and well, last year, September 2020. He's the co-organizer of the Swords Conference in 2012 and 2015, <coughs> Editor of the volumes, uh, of the proceedings of this conference. He um, studies martial arts into an intercultural perspective in the commissions for Kampfkunst and Kampfsport at the Deutsche Vereinigung für Sportwissenschaft. And is in the editorial board of the collection related to his martial arts studies book series, academic advisory board, also in the journal that is lying there. And he is a martial artist himself in so, Peki Piti Kirsha. Thank you very much, Sandra. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Daniel, for organizing this panel. Um, <coughs> this is uh, a depiction from a Fiorette that we have seen before now this morning. The other one is a depiction from a, a, a Chinese um, fight book or martial arts manual, however you would like to call it, from, from around 1600. Uh, so, your Kung Fu is very good, Mr. Fiorette. Uh, you can see how these how these images already mirror each other, how the, how the body positions depicted are quite similar. Um, and in this talk now, I, will, I do not want to present you definite answers. What I want to present is I want to raise the question um, whether a comparison between these types of sources uh, can be done, um, whether it is fruitful, um, or whether it's uh, methodologically too complicated uh, to wield any uh, substantial uh, value at all. So <clears throat> I want to start with uh, a short discussion of the um, um, sort of martial art, martial art as a global phenomenon. Because if we try to compare these sources, we have to also uh, be able to compare the practice that Eric was talking about, the practice that they are supposed to be taking. And I'm uh, usually uh, using a definition of Peter Lodge in his book on Chinese martial arts from antiquity to the 21st century, which is, I think, applicable to most of them, or applicable to martial arts in general as a global phenomenon. Uh, I want to quote this. I define martial arts as the various skills or practices that originated with methods of combat. This definition therefore includes many performance, religious, or health-promoting activities that no longer have any direct combat application, but clearly originate in combat, while possibly excluding references to these techniques in dance, for example. Admittedly, the distinction can be muddled as one activity shades into the other. In addition, what makes something a martial art rather than an action done by someone who is naturally good at fighting is that the techniques are taught. Without the transmission of these skills through teaching, they do not constitute an art in the sense of being a body of information or techniques that aim to reproduce certain knowledge or effects. And you can see how this already relates to the two talks that we heard before. I think that there should be uh, think three things to be added. Um, methods of combat, I perceive as, as all methods for the wide continuum of physical struggle, uh, meaning uh, combat sports, wrestling, um, medieval wrestling uh, in the in olden days, or modern day judo, for example, would also fall into these categories, according to my definition. Um, Rather than only transmission, I will speak about uh, reproducibility and systematization. We can imagine like the, the martial arts hermit living somewhere in the forest and dividing his own martial arts system. And if he's able to reproduce it, to turn it into a body of knowledge, then I would say it is, it constitutes a martial art. And <clears throat> finally, um, transmi transmission and teaching, what exactly constitutes them? So when, um, for example, today, uh, children are learning martial arts move from the video games they play. Is that in, in how far is that already a kind of transmission of, of knowledge? So these are their theoretical uh, implications behind the question of what is a martial art, but this will lead too far away. There's a conference on martial arts studies in two weeks in Cardiff. Please, everybody come there, then we can discuss the matter further. Um, so if we perceive martial arts as a global phenomenon that can be um, fruitfully compared uh, throughout centuries and different regions of the world, then the question is, do fight books also constitute a global phenomenon? Um, we, who are here in this panel, we are aware of the existence of a rich tradition of European fight books, 
to whichever aim exactly they were written, and as we heard, this is a very complicated question, one yeah, that needs to, to um, further research to be done. Um, and anyway, five books as books that transmit techniques of interpersonal combat, they are not uh, restrained to Europe alone. You will find them as well, for example, in India. This is <coughs> a page from the Nihang Nama, the book on the sword uh, from the 16th century, written in South India. Um, unfortunately, only a few leaves of this book have survived. They are in the uh, National Museum in uh, New Delhi now. I think it's only four pages that have survived, but it was uh, <coughs> part of depicting, depicting um, different kind of swords that the men are fighting with, and obviously describing also the technique. Or you have a, also a Japanese tradition on five books. This is also from the 16th century, the Yagi Shintaku scroll, and I, I like these. <laughs> They're very nice. Okay. And this is a very early Japanese example. Um, Shinkage means new shadow, it's the new shadow school, which <laughs> so, um, yes, you have, you have comparable, or at least at the first glimpse, you have comparable material from other cultures as well. And now this is the question that I want to raise. Uh, shall we, are we allowed to compare these? Um, there's a problem. If we compare these, how do we know, and this is the quote I um, put in English, how do we know before the, we compare <coughs> these that they belong to the same category? Yeah? By comparing them, I already make them similar in a way. It's my decision that I put these, these books into the same category. Um, and well, this is a, this is a basic hermeneutical question, of course, uh, or problem. Uh, and I think that we have to be very careful when we choose these sources and put them into one category. Yeah, very careful and look at each and every one specifically. But yet, at the same time, I think that we, we, can, have, uh, we can have results if we do so. And in the discussion of European five books, and this is why I, why I put up this picture, in the um, discussion of European, European five books, um, usually people do sort them into one category. Yeah? Although they can be uh, very much different, uh, especially when you do not look at the sources uh, on a PDF on your computer. Yeah? Oh, this is my five book files, and there are 20 of them, and okay, next, because then the, the, the materiality of them become all the same, they are on your screen. But when you look at the books in reality, what they look like, and this is why I took this picture of my colleague, uh, this is Maximilian Bertel from, from the German Blake Museum, and um, uh, he is showing two of the five books that we have in our collection. And the one is the Agonauts, it's the fourth edition of the Agonauts from the mid uh, 16th century, and uh, this is a Thibault, uh, probably the, the most luxur luxurious fencing book ever produced printed ones uh, from uh, 1630. And uh, you see, like, the Thibault is like this big. It has 420 something pages. Yeah. It is almost a different media than the Agonauts is. But still, when we refer to European pipe books, everybody says, yeah, they're two pipe books, of course. They belong to the same category. Um, so I think that we can also uh, widen this, uh, this genre yeah, and also include the Asian material. And the material that I want to talk about now is Chinese pipe books, uh, for the simple reason that they are the ones I'm most familiar with. Um, I'm not a sinologist, I have to say. I do not read, unfortunately, I do not read um, old Chinese. I wish I could. So I try to, uh, to bring in this, this knowledge as best as I can, but I can only rely on what other authors have written on the Chinese sources. This, of course, the problem, and this would be uh, the, the task for the future, to gather specialists from the various fields and really to see what they are saying on the subject. Um, there has been uh, research in Chinese martial arts history uh, in China from the beginning of the 20th century on. So there is a, a, a martial arts studies, a Chinese martial arts studies, and unfortunately, very few of these texts of those researchers have been translated. <coughs> so most of the time, you have to rely on, on the few titles that are produced by Westerners on the, on the Chinese materials. The first Chinese pipe book that is mentioned um, is indeed very, very old. Um, this is a book or some, some chapters on hand fighting, on, on unarmed close-border combat. Um, 
and they were mentioned in the Han Shu, which is a, a large collection, gives like a catalog of texts that were available at that time. And the Han Shu dates probably to <coughs> somewhere between um, 25 and 22 AD, but no, <coughs> sorry, no copies of these six chapters on hand fighting have survived today. But we know at least that it existed. And then we have a huge gap in time uh, until um, the, the first uh, surviving fight books. However, the first surviving fight books, I'll talk about them uh, in a minute, um, they stem from the 16th century, but the imagined tradition of fight books is older. Yeah. Um, it's a tendency in martial arts to, to relate your martial art to some mythic origin, very often. And so there's, there's myths about um, fight books or fight texts that even predate these, um, the ones that I'll be talking about soon. Uh, some styles of Chinese martial arts uh, depict their origin in, um, yeah, in, a, in a mythic time. Uh, and they have stories, for example, like one night uh, there was a guy, he was uh, in, a, in a temple because he had to flee from the rain, and then he saw in a statue there was a scroll hidden, and he took out the scroll, and on the scroll there were the techniques of Sing Yi boxing. And he learned it from the scroll, and he gave it to us. So um, the, the techniques that we use, they are true, Good because they came to us like uh, they were given to us by the gods. But this is the like legendary period, uh, and then the Chinese fight books that we know that still exist today, they uh, are can be put into the early woodblock period. They are woodblock prints from the um, the first one is from the 1560s. I found different dates when this book was uh, published for the first time. Some would have been written um, 1560, 1584. I don't exactly know, but roughly this area. Um, and what's interesting in China in comparison to Europe is that the, the printed books predate the manuscripts that we have. This is then the second period. Hand copies. The oldest existing hand copy manuals date from about uh, 1730. They were largely useless unless one had already trained in that school, as the text tended to be made up of content <coughs> notes, mnemonic rhymes, and esoteric philosophy. These hand copy texts were intended exclusively for students of that lineage, and you, could, you can already see how that relates to what we heard in the, in the uh, last lecture. Um, these periods here, um, they were sort of by Kennedy and Wolf, who wrote on Chinese martial arts manu ma manuscripts of manuals. And they are not exclusive. Yeah. So you have, of course, uh, printed books and manuals at some point at the same time. And there's <coughs> two other periods that they also have in the, in the list, the Republican period and the modern period. I will not speak about them. This is the time when you also find the photographs. Yeah. And when the, when the question, how do we uh, depict um, bodily movements in, in painting, uh, is not longer valid because we use a photograph for that. And that's uh, set in very early as well, like in the, around 1900, you have books like this. So, the books I want, I'm concerned with now are the woodblock prints, and I made a list um, of the early Chinese uh, manuals. We don't, I don't want to, to go through them uh, in, in details, but what I want to point out are two things that you can see already, is that many of the authors that we know of all these books, fortunately, are uh, military, many generals, and that the uh, um, weapons for which they give techniques are um, they lean towards staff weapons. It's, there are manuscripts on sword fighting as well, we have good sword material. But there's a lot about, uh, about helmets, about spears, about staff fighting. So, and the reason for this is also them being based in the, in the military. Um, the background, how these books came into being, was obviously that um, the Chinese were struggling with Japanese pirates on their coasts. And um, some of these sources tell that these Japanese pirates in close quarter combat were superior to the Chinese forces, because the Chinese forces were not um, trained well enough. And there, the Chinese also had the feeling that our technique is lacking. Uh, the Chinese, gung fu, uh, the Japanese gung fu is better than our gung fu, so <laughs> we have to improve on that. And um, Chinese techniques, uh, Japanese techniques, were been taken over and learned by Chinese. And uh, another answer was to the Japanese sword fighting that 
the staff fighting had to be improved, the helper fighting, to be able to answer the Japanese threat. This is uh, an example, a uh, depiction of techniques. It's from a sword manual now, from uh, Cheng Sang Yu. This is also around 1600 or a little bit earlier. And I put it here as an example how the Chinese depicted um, the fighting techniques. As far as I saw when I researched that, the, the typical European way of showing techniques which is very often that you have like two persons in a dueling situation uh, and you see there exactly what kind of technique is just happening there. This is not that usual for the Chinese manuals. You have that there as well. Uh, but most of the times it will give you <coughs> like, a, um, like a hoot or a lega, the German fight books would call it, like a starting position from where you're supposed to fight. And then it, uh, it um, will point out what you're supposed to do. Uh, so he's waiting with a sword raised high, and when the spear thrust comes in, you're supposed to push it down. And um, yeah, this is now from uh, the next image, is from another manuscript, uh, from the nephew of the author of the one we saw before. So he was family interested in these fighting systems. Um, this is a manual on the on the long axe. I included it especially for Yazon. So there's uh, Chinese manuals on that as well. And again, we have the situation, you have a starting position from where you're supposed to wait the incoming blow, and um, the text then describes how the technique uh, will be executed. Um, you will also find in these texts specialized language, what uh, Eric has been talking about before in the 133, for example, or the oldest European fight book, you have the text in Latin and then German um, terminology interspersed, and here this is similar, you have a Chinese text and then like um, martial arts terminology thrown in there. And obviously you have to be accustomed or you have to know already a little bit about martial arts to be able to understand what is the scissor step supposed to be. Um, some of them have these very flowery names already that you know from like Kung Fu movies, so this is then the crane stance or things like this. What are the aspects to which we could compare these? One of that is the question, how do you turn movement into image and text? And the authors of fight books have been struggling with this in Europe as well as in Asia for centuries. How do we make sure that the reader, if I really want somebody to understand what I'm writing, how do I make sure that the reader will understand? And you know from European fight books, for example, these footwork patterns, the Thibault that I showed before is very famous for that. He has a geometrical circle and on the circle he has a footwork pattern so that you can see uh, okay I'm, I'm supposed to step here and then my left has to go here and similarly this is a footwork pattern for a uh, staff form uh, and I find it very interesting how the author devised it because here he combined this diagram and uh, with the technical instructions uh, so you you can you can follow this you should move according to these lines and circles, and then you know what you have to do on which spot. The text is a mnemonic device. We had that before. Chinese martial arts literature, um, already the oldest one from 1560, um, is often um, written in rhymes. And uh, the general uh, Qi Ji Wang, who wrote the oldest one, he was obviously not a very good poet. Mm -hmm. So people say his, his uh, poetry is uh, not that excellent according to Chinese standards, but still he used it. Yeah. And on the one hand, I suppose um, to be um, better memorized. Uh, on the other hand as well, and this is why I wrote down and literature, yeah, because he wanted to express with his five book, I'm also a learned man. Yeah. I can write according to our uh, literary traditions. Strategies of learning then. If I have the techniques represented in my book, how can the student, um, how can he acquire, and how can he acquire these techniques that he can use them in, in fighting? And um, some of the books give information on that, how the training should be devised. Uh, for example, um, they, they describe how you should on your protective gear, like protective armor, like you would have in nowadays HEMA sparring or kendo or fencing, 
and then uh, you're supposed to do sparring matches against your partner. So the question is not only to the technique, but how the technique is given to the student. An interesting question is the perspective on martial arts traditions by the authors themselves. And the Chinese are, um, um, sometimes give very detailed information about how they perceive Chinese martial arts culture. Qi uh, Jiguang, once again, from this oldest uh, manual, um, he lists 16 uh, close quarter combat, like hand combat styles, and gives them by name. And they have this already this very flowery name, that this is the thumb <coughs> blossom fighting, this is the northern fist, things like this, the family charm system of fighting. And he comments on them like, yeah, but all of them are flawed because uh, some of them are very good with the hands, but the footwork is bad. Some are very good with the feet, but the hands are bad. And I have to combine them and I have to pick out the best techniques. Yeah? I have to um, absorb what's useful and discard what's useless and put in a little bit of my own. Um, so they were clearly aware that they were part of a martial arts tradition and they extracted it as well. What is interesting is the social context of the fight book. Most of them, as I said, were written for the military in the beginning. And uh, later on, um, also uh, for and from literati who wanted to show that they are, even though they are more on the intellectual side of Chinese, Chinese culture, they are also fighting men, uh, but in a very, in a very uh, civilized manner. And they could express that with these fighting books. And then finally, and this didn't work because I was doing this with Open Office Impress, but I have it here. Um, while we can have the, the final discussion, I wanted to show you this. This is from um, a Chinese initiative that tried to recreate traditional Chinese fighting system according to these sources. So they are doing historical Chinese martial arts. It's comparable to what people are doing in the HEMA community, in the Western HEMA community nowadays. It's not modern Chinese Kung Fu practice, but it is a recreation of the techniques they found in the fight books. So, in the end, I think we have to be very careful if we want to compare these sources, but I think, yes, we can do, and I think um, it will yield some, some fruitful results. Thank you very much.